Communications, who by the way isn't officially the director of communications, um, said some things last week that really would get you fired at any other time in any other place in history. Um, and now we allow it because what? Because we're gangsters now and we're on the road to being a second world power and when you have a tin pot tyrant running things, this is how uh, we roll. Uh, we're, we're just a bit abusive, I don't... Yeah. Go. Sorry, I can't you. I want to hear you. Can we hear? Hey, you guys need to work on a lot of things. Yeah. <laughs> But you're making two different arguments. One is that the president is being a snowflake, and the second is that that the president's spokesmen are are engaging in hate speech and vulgar. And you know, I would disagree with you on a lot of certainly what Scaramucci said. I think I would prefer to have um, what you're calling the the, the snowflakes and the flo snowflake president. I'd prefer to have the snowflakes respond the way Trump does: fight back. I mean, don't sit around whining about your hate mail. Um, I, so far on the panel, I'm the one who's been called a hater. I've been called a xenophobe. I've been called any of you names, and you don't see me crying. Um, you know, give me your facts. And yeah, Trump does it in a colorful way, but shouting someone down isn't giving another argument. It isn't giving me a fact. It isn't giving me the declaration of independence from, you know, Brazil. <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, I, I'm not one to, here we go, I'm not one to defend uh, how the president and his top team communicate a lot of the time. I do think it's interesting that some people are pining for the good old days where presidents said erudite, sophisticated things to the American people, such as, if you like your plan, you can keep your plan. <laughs> To the, back to the subject matter of the panel on uh, campus censorship, one of the things that I find distressing as we discuss these issues is that a lot of people, particularly on the left, seems to, seem to conflate words that they don't like with violence, right? They, they conflate speech with violence and therefore justify violence to shut down speech. And I think that's a, a terribly wrong-headed way of approaching it. Uh, and, and that's why, you know, you mentioned Milo. He is not my cup of tea in a number of different ways. But the notion that people standing in line to go hear him speak should be pepper sprayed with uh, people smashing windows and burning cars around him with, uh, and the entire event shut down, absolutely not. That is a heckler's veto and it's disgraceful. I don't, it's not about the things that he has to say. It has to do with his right to say it and the criminal behavior of the people blocking him from doing so. That's the core of the issue. What, how should they be viewing this when they do have the challenge of safety and security of their students? And that does come into play. I know that's what the what Berkeley said, right, Anne? When, yes. yes. The poll tax on conservative speech. <laughs> no, but, but that's the challenge for university administrators. So should they be in a position where they are either increasing um, and, and put, putting more money out there for security costs, or are they actually deciding that certain speakers aren't coming on their campus? aren't coming for free. Ann Coulter doesn't speak for free at these universities. Milo doesn't speak for free at these universities. Come on now. I, people get paid. It's a gig. For all I know, this might be a very complex piece of performance art that you're doing, Ann, and I salute you for it if that's the case. <laughs> I mean, we know what the university should do. This isn't, it isn't up to us on this panel to decide. There are 200 years of Supreme Court cases. Berkeley has to allow the speech. The same way in the South, Democrats had to allow blacks to vote. They have <laughs> is, I mean, blindingly a state institution. Beyond that, any university that accepts federal funds, they have to allow the state. Amen to that. Amen to that. Add one small uh, nugget to this, one additional thought, which is 
when you have administrators making the case, as we've seen with Ann and others, that because the speaker is controversial, there it needs to be increased security. That security, therefore, must be paid for by the host organization, the college Republicans or YAF or some right-wing group or right-leaning group. That is essentially or actually literally making one side's speech less free, literally, by charging the group the, the extra security for fees, which is sort of a roundabout way of allowing sort of the, the mob or the, the jackals to win, because the college Republicans may have a, uh, a budget to bring in and pay her to speak. They may not have five to 10,000 extra dollars after that to keep violent hooligans from beating people up. That should be on the school, right? And in terms of, uh, in terms of the U.S. government federal funding, should there be a difference in how an administrator at a private university is able to welcome or not welcome speakers and public <coughs> universities? In theory, yes, but um, no. Again, we have a long line of Supreme Court cases and rulings by agencies. Not if they're accepting student aid. Not if they're accepting federal grants. No, no, no. That comes with strings. So if you want to have your private universities, don't accept the federal money. I think well, I have nothing to say. I mean, as far as uh, I, it's imperative that people listen to one another. I think that would be an important thing. And I don't advocate violence of any kind uh, under any circumstances. And I don't think shouting people down is a particularly effective way of communicating. Um, what I take exception to is uh, people victimizing themselves. Uh, and saying that they're not being heard when um, we've heard nothing um, but the white privileged voice of white privileged people. And I say this to the white privileged people. We've had a surfeit of it. We are up to here with it. We have been poisoned by it. The reason why everything is in the state it's in is because we've heard far too much from rich, white, privileged, toxic people. And it would be nice if the dialogue was a little more balanced. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, during the election, you may recall, uh, on television, um, people would come on, or they would show an empty hall where Trump was about to speak for an hour. And then he would come on and say something that had nothing to do with anything, and they'd analyze that forever, rather than show anything that Hillary Clinton was talking about, which was perhaps about policy or boring things that people don't like. Um, this is a very mild case that I'm putting forward here, uh, because I, uh, I'm aware that you're all going to boo in about five seconds. <laughs> and it doesn't hurt my feelings that much either. I'm a comedian, so uh, I'm used to being booed. Um, <laughs> Um, I just feel like uh, there's a very big, uh, there's, there's a lot of disingenuousness uh, uh, going around um, on the part of people who are uh, on the right in particular, um, that they're being victimized. And um, they've had the mic forever and ever, as long as I can remember. I don't remember there ever being, you were speaking of Hannity and Combs. Um, Mr. Combs was a nice person. He did, I don't think that the liberal left was something that he was representing in a giant way. Uh, in my opinion. Uh, I would love to see someone uh, on TV that wasn't a white person give their opinion all the time the way white people are allowed to. Yeah. I don't know if that makes I, I think the idea that conservatives have had the microphone exclusively in America forever is preposterous. <laughs> um, as looking at the When, when you use the term white privilege, um, I think that this is, in some respects, a useful term, right? People who look like us have, for the entire existence of humanity, enjoyed a privileged place. And that is something that we should keep in mind when we're interacting with people who don't look like us and come from different backgrounds. Introspection is good, right? However, using white privilege as a term to say, comma, and therefore, your opinion right. is less important, less welcome, shut up. That, that's where I say no. Like, I think it's used as a term to try to 
seek to de delegitimize something that I might have to say as opposed to addressing the content of what I have to say. My skin color and my, and my sex should not determine whether the content of my statements uh, are valid or not. I know what you're saying, but the, the playing field's not level, so therefore, I think... Are you trying to level it? That's the question. Are you trying to level it? We, we have one level? black president and no women presidents. What when we have had 45 black mean? presidents and 45 women mean? presidents, what then the playing field is slightly What does that mean? <laughs> Instead of using cliches about white privilege and toss, toxic really masculinity, about the Declaration of Independence and the Magna Carta, for goodness sakes, that's a cliche. Whoa! Oh, I can't walk through a college campus without hearing about Martin Luther's 95 Theses. Whoa! What a cliche I'm using. Um, instead of using cliches like toxic masculinity and, and white privilege, I thought I'd do what I think purpose of speech is, and that is cite facts. Um, I have two points on this, one that is not true, one that it's used as a cover to once again allow the left, Democrats in this country, to deny blacks genuine civil rights. Point one, um, come on, give me a break, we all know there's affirmative action, not only for African Americans, the only ones who deserve it, for, oh, um, you know, Thai Americans, Hispanic Americans, blah, 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 blah. Um, we know for a fact on college campuses. There are groups for Asians, there are groups for Latinos, there are groups for Blacks. Oh, you try to start a white group and see how that white group is still up there. Point two, I will just, so it's nonsense. Um, point two is, as I describe in my book, Mugs, liberals pretended to care about Black civil rights for about six minutes, and then suddenly, um, what the purpose of civil rights were, was to make up for the legacy of slavery. It is to redress past injustices. African Americans have been in this country as long as white Americans. They got the short end of the stick for about two centuries. That is the purpose of affirmative action. That is why there are special rules for African Americans. And then suddenly, we spend 50 years dumping every other culture of the world on this country. And oh, it's not black Americans anymore. It's Rainbow Coalition. Now suddenly uh, ties show up on Friday and then you know start complaining on Monday. Oh, I noticed there are no ties on the evening newscast. When do we suddenly, I mean, we are a biracial country. We owe one half of this, or one part of this, something. To talk about white privilege is to create a demon to try to bring the, the rainbow together. No, I'm sorry. African Americans are not the same as somebody who just ran across the border Great. yesterday. Not that is a special category. Great. And that's what white privilege is meant to disguise. Preach! Somebody talking the truth on this panel. Promoting hatred. Preach! Wow. <laughs> I support Ann Coulter's right to say whatever vile, hateful, racist <laughs> And I'm really glad that we still have an open internet where people like me and people like Ann and people like each of you can say what you want and need to say that reflects your own experience, your own strength, your own history and that we can have a common dialogue. I'm really glad that that exists. No one can kick me or kick Ann off the internet. And I'm hoping that Ajit Pai, the new FCC commissioner that Trump put in place, it looks like they're gonna completely gut net neutrality, which is an unsexy word, but it, what, it's what makes it possible for all of us. You who are sitting there who might have different views than me, and you 
people are sitting there who agree with me, it's really important that we put principles before personalities and that we preserve a free and open commons for the exchange of ideas. I'm not sitting here talking over Anne or, or hoping that people will come in here and interrupt uh, people whose views I might disagree with. I think it's really important that we have more of these kinds of conversations face to face. We are all Americans. So we have microphones along the aisles and we would invite people if they would like to ask questions. Is your name Greg? Greg. Okay. So, first of all, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution are not catchphrases. They are the documents that allow you to speak up there freely. And they are the documents that the men and women of our military, I have a question, I have a question. The men and women of our military allow us to have free speech. So, that is what leads me to my question. As a former educator, we do not have the freedom or the ability to have free speech. So my question to you is not only do we have non-free speech to from our professors, from our teachers to our students, but how do we allow the teachers to actually be able to have free speech if they're not liberal? Okay. Um, do you want to answer that, Greg? I, I, I didn't understand all yeah, so, so uh, we're just going to make a quick comment. So it's very hard to hear you from those microphones. So one sentence, short questions. We're really going to have to keep it to that so that we can, we can get to your questions. Yes. It's, it's hard to hear from these microphones. So the Constitution and the are not they're not So, okay, if we'll go here, just one short question, please, from this microphone up front. I said, when are we going to stop to allow people like today to disrupt speech for other people to hear? That's abominable, that should never happen. And we are in a civilized society. It's about time for people act like it. Okay, and again, we're gonna ask that these are questions. <laughs> questions and not comments. Why don't, we'll go to the microphone in the back. So, I find it interesting that when Donald Trump was elected, Democrats were protesting, but when Obama was elected, Republicans were protesting. What? So why is it that Democrats wait, protest? Wait, wait, um, actually, Republicans were not protesting the mere election. The protest came when he passed, Ob or where was, they were pushing through Obamacare. Um, you did not see anything equivalent to the Women's March. It wasn't just the election of Obama. It was when they started to do things that would change our lives and take our health care away. That's why people protested. Okay, we'll go to the front microphone. And again, a short question. Thank you. All right, I did a question from Ms. Coulter. Uh, so uh, I'm a professor at a, a university in California. And uh, I'm new. I've only, only been here one year. but. Um, uh, Based on my experience, I think it is true that most professors are, are liberal, uh, but I, but uh, in the news when I talk about a, a professor, speeches like yours being shut down, uh, that's not the experience that I've had with my professors, uh, with my colleagues. And when I talk to them, uh, they seem to uh, agree. So my question is, do you think your experience is um, uh, just influenced by a few administrators or a few professors? Because it doesn't seem like, uh, from my experience, that, that uh, most professors would, would want to shut your speech down. And who is your question directed to? Uh, Ms. Coulter. Yeah. Did that make sense? I couldn't hear any of that. And by the way, if I could also endorse the idea, there should be one sentence and it should end with a question mark because it's very hard to hear what you guys are saying from here. Um, uh, do you think your speech was shut down by just a few administrators or professors? Or do you think it was um, uh, some sort of... Um, it varies college to college. I mean, I describe college speeches, like I say, I've been doing this for more than a decade, about 20 college speeches a year on average, I'd say. Um, and I described it at the beginning of, um, if Democrats had any brains, they'd be Republicans, which 
which is that it's, I mean, as, as Guy described, we have a lot of fun at my college speeches. I'll take questions until the liberals have collapsed of exhaustion. Um, and at Harvard, at Yale, I spoke to the Yale um, Debating Society a couple of years ago, and frequently Smith. All, I can always tell whether the college speech is going to be fun by looking at the average SAT scores. Uh, because they want to challenge you. It tends to be, and you'll notice this if the attacks, at least until now, um, the attacks on conservatives, including, you know, Bill Kristol, now um, Richard Dawkins, famous atheist, has been shut out of Berkeley for an untoward remark he made on Twitter about Muslims. Um, but in historically, the better colleges, they're smart kids. They want to they wrangle with you. It's fun. A good time is had by all. It tends to be the... I'm sorry, the community college kids um, and college dra dropouts who show up um, dressed as Nazis, again, their native garb. Um, it, things have changed now. I mean, it is being rewarded. So, for example, when I was saying, no, colleges have a constitutional responsibility to allow a constitutional right to be exercised. It's not that hard. This business, their excuse about, oh, they're going to be protesters. You know, you shut down the first protest, you expel any students involved, you find them, you arrest them, that'll be the end of that. If they want free speech, they can have it. But anyway, that's how it varies college to college. Okay, we're gonna go to the microphone in the back and just a question, please. Yes. So, uh, first, we're gonna go to, our, to Guy to add to that. I just wanna uh, add one thing. I think there are hopeful signs in this as well where people, hopefully, all in this room could come together and celebrate certain things. There's an NYU professor named Jonathan Haidt who's really good on these issues. He's a left-wing guy and he's really concerned about the direction things are going. And so he started a group called Heterodox Academy where there have been hundreds of professors, most of them left-leaning from around the country, signing on to basically this credo, which is we need to have open, free, robust exchanges of ideas and not shut things down. That's a very good development. John Lovett, one of the guys on the Pod Save America crowd, uh, he wrote a wonderful piece in The Atlantic a couple of years ago on this exact issue. I think that there is an ability to link arms across the political divide when it comes to protecting free exchange of ideas. And that's why I think events like this, uh, at, at their best, uh, are very important. Yes. Uh, hello. This question is directed at the entire panel. So given that there's a fair amount of subjectivity in interpreting Supreme Court holdings and federal regulations, what would you all suggest as a reasonable metric for university administrators to draw the line between what could be construed as a very, a very, very strenuous argument between two people and something that could be legally construed as throwing hate speech? Guy, do you want to hate? Hate, sp hate speech is constitutionally protected speech. Right, there, there's no loophole. I'm, very, I'm sorry, there's no loophole for hate speech in the Constitution. I'm sorry, was my question? You know, one way it could be done, obviously he is right, there is no such thing as yeah, hate speech, but come on, these are college students, college groups, they have to raise money, a lot in my case, uh, to bring us in. You're not going to have a planner standing up on campus. They, they, they have to be student groups who are choosing to hear these people. Um, so, I mean, the Klan speech is protected under the Constitution, but I don't think that's really what we're talking about, and I think that's what you're getting at. Student groups are inviting them, there is a process. We are talking about views that are within the range of, of what political debate is. And, and I also, I worry about the defining down of hate, where things that you disagree with equal hate, and if hate is the buzzword that's used to suppress speech, I get worried about it. If I might add something to what uh, uh, a guy just said uh, about the defining down of hate, there's also uh, a refining uh, of hate, uh, which is um, people who are wildly racist, uh, homophobic, and misogynistic um, will say, oh, well, that's how I feel. Well. Um, there is no real support for your prejudice. Um, if you're a bigoted person and you